Hello, and welcome to episode six. This is our last episode on a Greek writer before we turn to the Romans for the second half of the series. And turning from the sublime to the ridiculous, today we're talking about the comedies of Aristophanes, and in particular, Clouds and Lysistrata. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Emily, and thank you for talking to me again. Hello, Tom. I'm excited to be here. So if we begin with, with the man himself, what do we know about Aristophanes' life? In his new translation of four plays, which you've reviewed for the LRB, Aaron Pachigian includes a whimsical biographical note about the author, which says only that Aristophanes was the most celebrated comic playwright of 5th century Athens, and that he lost his hair young. And is that the limit of what we know? <laughs> it's it's a good joke, and of course it's appropriate to have good jokes because he made a lot of, a lot of good jokes. Um, we we know quite a lot about his poetic dramatic output. We know the titles of most of the forty plays he produced in his lifetime. We know roughly when he lived. He was significantly younger than Euripides, the last dramatist we talked about. So he was born in the 440s and lived into the 4th century, into the 380s. Beyond that, we really know very, very little about his biography. We're not told that he took up city offices in the way that we're told about Sophocles. So in contrast to Sophocles, who was clearly friends with Pericles, friends with important political people in the city. That's not the narrative that we get about Aristophanes. But does that mean exactly what, what does that mean? Does that mean that he was somehow a rabble and an outsider? I don't know that we can necessarily say that. It just means that we don't know, know very much about his life beyond the theatre. So when and, and where were Aristophanes' comedies performed? Would it have been at the same festival as, say, Euripides' tragedies, that you'd have three days of tragedy and then a day of comedy at the end? Um, both. So so many of Aristophanes' comedies were performed at the city Dionysia, so in the same context as tragedy. And the city Dionysia did include, um, we think, a day of comedy as well as three days of tragedies and satyr plays. So, for instance, the Lysistrata was put on at the Dionysia. But then there was also a separate festival which happened earlier in the year, the Lenaia, at which comedy was the central dramatic form and the comic festival was the primary thing at the Lenaia. The Lenaia was a smaller festival and it was earlier in the year and therefore during the winter months when sailing wasn't good. So it was primarily a, a festival focused on an audience of Athenians in contrast to the great Dionysia where there would have been lots of foreign dignitaries from other Greek-speaking states coming to the, to the festival. So I think that also sort of helps make sense of the focus of comedy, which is very much on the city of Athens. And it's very much, a lot of the jokes are sort of in jokes that are funny if you're Athenian and you have to know the people. You have to know exactly what's been happening in city politics over the last couple of months for it to be funny. Whereas tragedy has this um, much more sort of universal, or at least if you're an elite Greek man, um, relevant to you kind of theme to it. And is that also one of the differences with the satyr plays? Because they're superficial sim similarities and sort of low characters with phalluses gambling about and lots of drinking and that. <laughs> so the, but how, yes. how, is a, how does a comedy of Aristophanes differ from a satyr play? Yes, I think for a modern audience, this, they can be puzzling that, that ancient people had no sense that satyr play and comedy were at all the same genre. They seemed to the ancient Athenians completely different genres. Satyr plays are different because their, their whole setting is different. They feature centrally mythological characters, just like tragedy features mythological characters. Whereas comedy, old comedy, features characters that the playwright has made up, along with some local celebrities like Socrates or Euripides coming on. So it has much more of the um, Saturday Night Live sketch comedy vibe than, than the mythical sense which satyr plays have. They're about wild spaces and about the, the jolly japes with the horny satyrs getting drunk and being idiots on the mountainside. Whereas um, old comedy is about the jolly japes and people getting drunk and being idiots in the city. So it's imagined as a different genre because even though, of course, there are jokes, in fact, in all three of the dramatic genres of Athens, including tragedy, um, jokes don't define the genre. The setting does. Right. And although we're maybe coming to this a bit later, but Aristophanes' birds, for example, that is outside the city, isn't it? That mm -hmm. the characters, they leave the city and go off to cloud cuckoo land to live in a yes. sort of utopian... To found a new a city. Kind of so it's, I mean, yeah. yes, I mean, it's, it's, you're absolutely right that there are ways that, that birds is an outlier in, its, in the way that it's outside the city. But then it, it also, in a way, fits because it's, um, 
it's about what is, what is a city and how do we found one. And one can read the birds as these Athenians replicating a version of Imperial Athens, even in the sky. Um, so I think it's not exactly un-Athenian. It's very much engaged with the themes of contemporary Athens, even though it's got this zany animal chorus setting as well. And on the, <laughs> the question of zany animal choruses, which there are a lot the, the, um, in frogs, named for its chorus of frogs, um, which won first prize at the Linnaea in 405, the year after Euripides died. Um, and it involves the god Dionysus travelling to the underworld to bring Euripides back to life. And presumably this is one of the things you're talking about with the local celebrities and the currency. And it's, oh no, Euripides is dead. Tragedy is dead. What are we going to do? Let's bring Euripides mm -hmm. back to life. And we've talked a bit about this when we were talking about Sophocles and, and Euripides, but of, our, of the reception of, the, of those tragedians and the ideas about them comes from the way they're represented by Aristophanes. A whole lot comes from Aristophanes and specifically from the frogs, as well as from the Thesmophoria Azusai, which also has Euripides in it. Um, I mean, Aristophanes, of course, fits Euripides and Aeschylus into the model that he very often centers his plot around, which is a contrast between old culture and new culture, or between tradition and new ways. So Euripides is made to represent the new, the innovative new ways that might be corrupt in the city, and Aeschylus is made to represent back in the days of Marathon, back in the days before women were corrupted by watching or by hearing about the characters in Euripides, then was that, was that, were the old days better or were the new days bet better? And that theme or that question of the, a clash between generations and a clash between the old, old ways and the new ways occurs in almost every Aristophanes play we have. So it seems to be a sort of feature of his work and maybe of the genre. Um, is that actually a, a nuanced account of the relationship between Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, of course it isn't. It's not supposed to be a nuanced account. It's supposed to be funny, and it is funny. And it's funny also in the various ways that Aristophanes manages to make, to, sort of to, to literalise metaphor and to literalise the ridiculousness of the um, Athenian assumption that the job of dramatists is to teach you something. And so if, if, if their job is to teach you something, then maybe we can weigh out exactly how valuable are these words versus those words. And so there's a, there's a wonderful sort of stage business of let's weigh the words and see which ones have the most weight as if words were like, just like gold and we can figure out which ones are going to save us. And they do. And, and Aeschylus wins and Dionysus ends up bringing Aeschylus back instead of, instead of Euripides. He does. Though he, yes. So there's this... In a way, the plot seems to tell you um, so Aeschylus is better than Euripides and the old ways are better than the new ways. But it's also very clear that, that Aristophanes is mocking Aeschylus as well. I mean, both in, in the clouds, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and in the frogs, there's definitely mockery of the traditionalist as well as of the newfangled character. There's, an, there's a presentation of, of Aeschylus as totally pompous and full of himself and also obsessed with boys' bottoms. And all of those things are funny, but they're, they're not necessarily presented as, if only we could get back to those days when these guys were so pompous and so much obsessed with going to the gym. And in, and in Lysistrater as well, isn't there, that the, cor the, old, the chorus of old men sort of talk about how they fought at all these battles that actually took place 100 years ago and they, they can't mm -hmm. possibly have done, which mm -hmm. is a bit like, <laughs> it's a bit like boomers talking about the Second World War and what, you know, yeah. what <laughs> we won the war, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, the glory days, which is complete fantasy, yes. The greatest generation is always some earlier generation. Aristophanes is very much aware of the, the fantasy of tradition. And, and that, I mean, even to go back to the Iliad, there's that bit where Nestor tells all the heroes, oh, you're, you're no good compared to Theseus, that the really yes. great heroes are all in the yes. past. So even, <laughs> even in the Iliad, people are talking about how the good old, yes. the good old days. Good old days. So if you move on to clouds now, which again stages this argument between old ways and new ways, doesn't it? But in, not in the not in the theatre, but in the context of of education, if that's mm. not an yeah an, an anachronistic term for it. Yes, I mean I think that I think both plays, in fact, all of the plays are about education. The Frogs is is also about how does how does the theatre teach and what 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 would a corrupting form of paideia be from the theatre. So paideia is it, it's related to the term for boy or childhood, um, but it connotes education. Um, the Clouds focuses on the new forms of education that have come into the city with the sophists or wisdom makers. I think we talked about them a little bit when we talked about Medea and the idea of Sophia or new kinds of cleverness, new kinds of skill, which could potentially be taught and could be associated with foreigners. 
in the clouds, Socrates, who in fact wasn't a foreigner, um, but was an Athenian, is associated, is, is presented as the primary sophist who has this wonderful setup of a thinkery. I think that's how Aaron Puchigian translates the, the school of, so- of Socrates in this play. And in this school, he teaches all kinds of baloney, um, such as logic chopping that has to do with how measuring how far a flea can, can jump, new kinds of language analysis, which various sophists were interested in. So he teaches um, the students that they should always say chicken and chickeness and drill down into the irrationalities of language and gender. And he also teaches that there are new new gods in the sky instead of the instead of the old ones. And the chorus in this play is not frogs or wasps or um, birds, but clouds. So it's the most abstract and immaterial chorus you could have of these you might think sort of wishy washy new new deities who are up in the sky, but in fact they're not they're not not exactly gods, um, and they help him un- to introduce some kind of new metaphysics that has to do with something other than the old school Olympian gods. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.